everyone. Welcome back to the Catholic Culture Podcast. You know, all the way back at the beginning of this show in uh, May 2018, um, so going on uh, five years now, episode two uh, was about a little remembered movement called Operation Rescue. Well, little remember, remembered, depending who you talk to, people who were around then uh, will remember it. But Operation Rescue was uh, a pro life, a part of the pro life movement. It was really the largest peaceful civil rights movement in American history, just in terms of the number of num- the number of people participating and, and specifically the number of people arrested in the course of pe- peaceful protest. Um, my, my colleague at Catholic culture, Phil Lawler had written a book in the early nineties, uh, giving the history of this movement up to that point. And uh, I remember he said in that book that between 1988 and 1992, over 50,000 rescuers had been arrested. And so that's about six times as many arrests as during the entire civil rights movement, um, uh, say in the 1960s. So um, today I'm returning to the topic of Operation Rescue, and I'm really excited because I have the founder um, and the original leader of that organization with me today, uh, Randall Terry. He is promoting a new documentary about the movement uh, that looks really amazing, and uh, I'll show a promo for that documentary in the course of this podcast. But the documentary isn't out yet because they need fundraising to finance the the creation of this thing. Uh, but the footage that they have looks incredible, so I'm hoping that doing this podcast will get some people to go and donate and help them make the uh, the documentary, which is going to be called Dragon Slayers. So uh, without further ado, I'm happy to welcome Randall Terry. Uh, thanks for coming on the show. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me, Thomas. Like I said, not everybody knows about Operation Rescue or remembers it. It's strange because it's such a a colorful and dramatic part of pro-life history, um, but it's something that seems to have been forgotten by a lot of people or maybe a lot of young people don't know about it. Maybe some of them have a, uh, have a vague idea that um, you know, blo- blockading abortion clinics is something that people once did more frequently, but they don't know the name of the the movement or how, the scale it was on. That was the thing that surprised me when I was learning more about, about it because I heard about it as a kid. But when I actually read Phil Lawler's book, I was I was shocked and amazed to hear about the scale of this thing and how long it went on. Of course, people are some people are still getting arrested today for for doing similar things, but it's just not as big of a uh, of a thing anymore. But it, it seems to have left a mark on the pro life movement. And, and so, um, just for the people who aren't familiar with it, can you can you just explain what what these rescues were? I mean, what what do the what do they actually look like? What was their purpose? We had over seventy thousand arrests by the time the Clinton administration broke our back from nineteen eighty seven to nineteen ninety four. It actually clocked in a little bit over seventy five thousand arrests, but wow. For perspective, it was 10 times the number of arrests that happened in the civil rights movement. So these are Mm. peaceful protests, peaceful arrests in front of abortion clinics. The we had several things going on. One of them was an act of repentance. So the, the Bible talks about two types of sins, the sins of commission and the sins of omission. Mm. And the message that I was heralding to Roman Catholics and to evangelicals was our hands have blood on them because we have failed to stop the killing. Deuteronomy chapter 21 says that to be free of the guilt of innocent blood, you have to not know who did the killing. You have Mm. to literally say, Lord, our hands did not shed this blood, nor have our eyes seen it. We Mm, don't know who did it. So, we could not say that because we knew right where the abortion clinics were. We knew who was murdering the babies. We knew what time of day they were murdering the babies. And we were calloused, preoccupied. We had maybe bad theology. We didn't understand it was our job to save these babies. So as God put this burning um, duty in my heart to rescue the innocent and to do everything I could to stop the shedding of innocent blood, I started searching through the scriptures. And the apostle James wrote, 
true religion and undefiled before God the Father is to help the widow and the orphan, the fatherless in their distress. Proverbs mm -hmm. 24 commands us, rescue those who are being led to the slaughter. Don't stand back and watch them die. That's a commandment. Wow. Psalm 82 commands us to rescue the fatherless, to do justice for the fatherless. And a fatherless child is a child without a father's protection. So as I studied the scriptures, I, I saw that this concept of the shedding of innocent blood goes from Genesis all the way to Revelation. And it usually means in the Old Testament, child sacrifice. So when you read the passages in the Mosaic uh, books of the law, most of the five books, the Pentateuch, you see this theme over and over. And then you see it in Jeremiah and you see it in Ezekiel where uh, the prophet Isaiah said, though you multiply prayers, God says, though you multiply prayers to me, I will not listen because your hands are covered with blood. And then the next thing says, seek justice, rebuke the ruthless. So this concept of innocent blood began to just fill my mind. And the, the Catholic Church teaches in its catechism that there are four sins that cry to heaven for vengeance. Some of the older catechisms put the number at five or, or it kind of like splits number four, but the chief sin, the number one sin that cries to God for vengeance is the shedding of innocent blood. Mm, yeah. And it brings a curse on the earth. So my message to people was, look, they're killing babies. We know where they're killing babies. And we are commanded by God to rescue the fatherless, to do everything we can to try and save them. So I was calling on people to repent I was saying we have sinned by letting this abortion industry, this child killing movement go on unchallenged. Mm. So I said, our act of repentance will be that we will go down to the abortion clinic and sit there. And we would do these massive sit-ins around the abortion clinic. We had microphones and little psalters, little books with prayers and songs in them. And we would sit and I, I told people, look, we're gonna go and we're gonna have church on the doorstep of hell because that's what an abortion mill is. It's like a portal into hell. So mm. we would go and we would sing and we would pray and then the police would come and say, you have to move or you're going to be arrested. And we would say, officer, if we move, they're gonna kill babies, so we're not moving. And depending on how many of us there were and how big the police department was, it might take them three hours to arrest us. It might take them 10 hours to arrest us. They might beg us and say, please don't, just don't make us carry you away. We'll try and get the abortion mill to close or to close early or you know, to not open. So there was a lot of negotiations that went on with the police, enormous media coverage. I mean, 60 Minutes, Oprah Winfrey, Donahue, Fox News, CNN, Good Morning America, Meet the Press. I had personal interviews with Dan Rather and with Leslie Stahl from 60 Minutes. It was the largest peaceful civil disobedience movement in American history. Yeah. So people say, how come I don't know about this? There's a really simple answer. Winners write history. Yeah, it's that simple. And up until now, when Roe versus Wade was overturned, we have been losing. The pro life movement has not been winning. And right. anyone who tells you otherwise is selling something. So when Roe was overturned, then people were saying, how did we get here? And that's when, well, I've, I've been getting a ton of requests for interviews and the history of this movement is suddenly very important to people mm. because what operation rescue did is I, I would say to people to the press look we're saving babies today in such a way that creates social tension we mm. must have a political solution to this we must make abortion against the law and no major social revolution in america has succeeded without social tension so mm. In addition to having, um, having 
you know, I just thought of something. You don't even know this. I, I recently just released a video called Randall's Rules of Righteous Revolution. Mm. And it's really high, it's highly produced. And if it's okay, I know how we're going to edit this. If we could drop it in right now, that would be really cool. Because sure. it'll say, yeah, it'll let's, let's do it right here. All right. Randall's Rules for Righteous Revolution. Well, let's go over Randall's Rules of Righteous Revolution. There are five of them. And these rules have been used throughout American history and brought the end of certain ills, evils, and brought a complete paradigm shift, literally a social revolution, an upending of the status quo and replaced it with something completely different. So those rules are, you ready? Radical rhetoric, incendiary images. Number three, aggressive actions. Number four, serious sacrifice. And number five, verifiable victory. Those are the five rules. I'm going to go over them. And we're going to show how if abortion in America is going to be made illegal, we have to use these tools, these political weapons, if you will. Look back at the Stamp Act in the 1760s, the Boston Tea Party, the American Revolution, the abolition of slavery, women's voting rights, the end of child labor, the end of segregation, all of these movements had these five elements. All right, let's start with radical rhetoric. They called King George a tyrant. That was not polite speech. Jesus called the Pharisees whitewashed tombs full of dead men's bones. The abolitionists could not stop with the invectives against the slaveholders. Women in the women's voting rights movement said that men were tyrants. They actually took the Declaration of Independence and took out the references to England and put in references to men. So we see radical rhetoric, jarring rhetoric, rhetoric that made people angry. That was a part of each of these movements. All right, then incendiary images. Think of the dog, the dogs in the water cannons in the, in the civil rights movement. Think of the images of women getting hauled away to jail for demanding the right to vote. Think of the images or the drawings of slaves or of black women being sold at the slave market. And everyone was thinking, oh no, she's about to become a sex slave for her slave master. Whether it was before photographs when they were making etchings and drawings or it was after, Images were always a key part. Little grimy boys working in coal mines, little girls working in textile mills. Then go to aggressive actions. In each of these movements, there were people who were arrested for civil disobedience. There were people who were committing crimes. Boston Tea Party, you remember the story, they dressed up like Indians and then they destroyed what would be the equivalent today of about 1.2, 1.3 million dollars worth of tea. Aggressive action, sitting at the lunch counter, the marches on the bridges, women getting arrested for trying to vote, the abolitionists risking their freedom to sneak slaves to freedom in the North or into Canada. And then the next was serious sacrifice. We are not gonna end the killing of children if we're doing it from our computer or from our couch. Our computers are valuable right now. We know that for spreading the message, but there's got to be in the street action. We've got to be willing to pay a price. It might be the loss of reputation. It might be the loss of comfort. Some of us have been to jail, been arrested. Maybe more of us are going to be for small civil disobedience actions where you're arrested and maybe you spend a couple hours in jail or a couple days, but it's still a serious sacrifice. What are we willing to sacrifice? What are you willing to sacrifice to bring the killing of babies to an end? And then the fifth was, verifiable victory. There are people who want to say, well, we had victory. Look, you know what victory looked like with women's voting rights, because all women can vote. No slaves can be owned. No children are dying in coal mines. Child labor is illegal. Segregation was defeated. The Jim, the Jim Crow laws had their backs broken. You can eat lunch anywhere you want. It's verifiable victory, total political legal victory. And that, my friend, is our mission. 
We are set to make abortion, child killing, from conception until birth, a crime in all 50 states. That's the mission. And when we accomplish that mission, we'll know it. It will be verifiable because it will be against the law to kill a human being from conception until birth. Look at the other social revolutions, look at the five rules, and then think, how do we apply these to ending the killing of human beings by abortion? And friend, that will take us through the kaleidoscope of radical rhetoric, incendiary images, aggressive actions, serious sacrifice to the end of verifiable victory. If you've enjoyed this, share it with your friends. God bless you. All right, so as you can see, this was really thought out. Every single major social revolution in America, without exception, had radical rhetoric, incendiary images, aggressive actions, serious sacrifice, and then finally, verifiable fruit. No one can own a slave. No one can keep a, or put a child to work in a coal mine. Women can vote no matter where they are. One of the reasons that the pro-life movement had not won is because except for the that window where you know operation rescue was really big many elements of the pro-life movement did not want to abide by the rules of social revolution so if if we're going to prevail i mean thank god uh, that roe was overturned but if we're going to prevail and make child killing illegal in all 50 states then mm. we are going to have to adopt these rules so when i was leading operation rescue we had thousands and thousands of people in the streets saying abortion is murder we will not let you kill babies today and we demand a law that outlaws the killing of babies from conception until birth because we had not won in winner's right history once the movement uh really had its back broken by the Freedom of Access to Clinic Entrances Act. That's the law that you've heard popping up recently. Mark Houck up in Pennsylvania was unjustly- Is that the FACE, the FACE Act? Yeah, yeah. Okay, that law right. came into existence okay. to destroy Operation Rescue and it succeeded. Hmm. So that that law broke our back, but I got sidetracked. The, um, the, the movement went to seed. So they thought, oh good, we got rid of them. But we set out to create social tension and we succeeded. And when they basically kept us from doing, you know, because the cost became so high, then people were like, okay, let's try other things. Let's do other things. And then you had Life Chain was born, 40 Days for Life came later. You had crisis pregnancy centers popping up all over the place. The number of organizations and movements that came as a direct fruit of Operation Rescue. Priests for Life. Priests for Life mm. was uh, Frank Pavone and, and Janet Moreno going to an Operation Rescue event and then saying, well, this is what we have to do. Mm. So this, this movement created a flood of other pro-life activism, but also, perhaps more importantly, it went to seed in the political arena. And the people okay. who had gone into the streets and had gone to jail said, fine, I'm going into politics. And well, well let me let me ask you then, um, because what you said it started in 1987. Um, so I was born in 1990. So what was the what was the atmosphere around the topic of abortion prior to Operation Rescue then? Are you saying that it was sort of just tacitly accepted more than it was say later in the 90s and early 2000s oh, good grief. yes it was by the time by 1987 abortion was not in the top 10 voter issues wow okay i didn't re i actually didn't know that yes it had just i just had to sort of radar. assume that it was a constant and if anything that the most extreme responses to it would have been around the time of roe you know well when it, was it, new. It, it was a bigger deal earlier but by 87 it was not in the top 10 
But here's what happened. It was a fact of life, sort of like a lot of Europeans think about it. it well, I've had a couple of people tell me if it wasn't for Operation Rescue, we would look at America like England, France, Germany, where it's just accepted and there's nothing you can do about it. And there's no political force to make it illegal. Wow. So we, we started in 87. By the election of 88, we had already had thousands and thousands and thousands of people arrested all over the country. We were national news, front page of the newspapers all over the country, 48 hours, 20, 20, 60 minutes. I mean, it was huge. Oprah Winfrey. And it went from being not on the radar to the ABC exit poll on election day, 1988, abortion was number one. It was the number one mm. voter issue. So wow. we had driven it from political oblivion, if you will, or the you know obscurity to the front page. And suddenly the Christian community said, yeah, we've got to stop this. And the fruit of it was, it became a hot button political issue. You have to remember, that there was a time when the Democrat party had a lot of pro-lifers and the Republican party had pro-choice people in it. But the rescue movement created uh, an enormous amount of political pressure on the Republican party to become hardcore pro-life and to have it mm. be a litmus test for candidates and the push to have it be a litmus test for Supreme Court judges, justices. So there's a book out called Wrath of Angels which was written, I think, in 96. And the, it was written by a Pulitzer Prize winning New York Times author, uh, James Risen, and by Kathy, oh, good grief, Kathy Thomas, um, Judy Thomas, I'm sorry, Judy Thomas. And both of them very skilled journalists for the Wichita Eagle, Kansas City Star, and then the New York Times. So they wrote this book, and they're not our friends. They are not our friends. <laughs> but you could see that when you read the book, but the premise of their book was that without Operation Rescue, there would have been no religious right as we understand it today. That the rescue movement provided the fuel and the manpower and the momentum and the money and the passion to create the religious right where abortion was now number one. The killing of babies, stopping the murder of babies was priority number one, which ultimately, as we know, led in part to the election of Donald Trump. And he kept his promise and gave us three pro-life justices who overturned Roe. So it's, yeah, a, it's something a that I really story. Uh, yeah. Uh, go ahead. I'm sorry. So, yeah, sorry. So, so I was just going to say, I'm something that I, uh, is still a little bit surreal to me. I don't know that I've like totally emotionally processed the overturn of Roe because it's just been something that's been around since I was alive it's the first political issue that I remember being aware of. It was the only one that really mattered in our family, pretty much, to be honest. Uh, we weren't very, um, you know, tribalistic about the, the, the parties. So um, it's still kind of strange to me because I don't know that I expected – it was possible to me that it might be overturned in my lifetime, but I, I didn't know that I expected it to be. I knew it would um, be in mine. Yeah. I never, yeah. I never doubted. I'd said no. we will dance on the grave of Roe versus Wade. For me, one of the most bitter days in my adult life was the day that Casey was decided and we were betrayed by Justices Kennedy, Souter, and O'Connor. That mm -hmm. was a dark day because that's when Roe should have been overturned, 1992. Yeah. The Webster right. decision paved the way. Harry Blackman resigned. And it should have been that Roe was overturned in in the summer of 92 under Casey and it wasn't and that sent us tragically on a 30 year uh wait i mean it's just so right. evil such such evil and you know kennedy was catholic it was one yeah, of the most horrific sad. betrayals of christ and the babies and the catholic church certainly in american history if not in recorded history the blood that is on the hands of those justices is unthinkable Wow. Um, when I talked to Bill Cotter uh, way back in episode two, he was the head of Operation Rescue in Boston. Bill's a great guy. He made he, 
yeah, he, he made a, a a real point of saying these were not demonstrations. The purpose was to save babies in that place on that day. Now you've talked about it also creating political tension. So it's not that it doesn't function to some degree like a demonstration. But can you talk about more of the the concrete day-to-day of it, of the, the day-to-day experience of being in a rescue and and the efficacy of it on that day? Well, as you'll see, as your viewers will see um, when we play the Dragon Slayers promo, it was always both, but the immediacy was to save babies. So we knew they're going to kill babies in that building at this time. And if we go there and we block the door and the abortionists can't get in and then the women can't get in, then no one's going to die there. It's very simple. Right. And we saved thousands and thousands of children. We will never know until we get to eternity how many children were saved and then they had children and then they had children. I mean, the course of the world is different because of the babies that we saved. I got to tell you one story. This is really fun. There was a mom there. I'm, my memory is she was Roman Catholic. I'm sorry, a grandmother on our first big rescue in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, 1987, mm. uh, Thanksgiving Day, Saturday. I think it was November 28th. Mm. So we're there. About 300 of us are blocking the door. The abortion mill never opened. There were 230 arrests, and the police begged us at 6 p.m., please leave. The rest of you just go. We're not going to arrest you if you'll just go. The abortion clinic is not going to open. So we said, okay, sure. <laughs> so we left. They ended up charging me anyway. I uh, I only spent a weekend in jail for that one. But um, we found out later that this, this woman, she was in her 50s, her teenage granddaughter had a had an appointment to kill her baby at that exact abortion mill on that exact day. Wow. And because she couldn't get in, she, the baby didn't die that day, and then the girl changed her mind. So this wow. grandma's grand great-grandchild was born because we were there blocking the doors. That is an important point because somebody might think, well, they're just going to come back the next day. You can't do it forever. But actually, some of them won't come back because sometimes it's it's they're feeling the emotional pressure and you give them that literal grace period <laughs> to rethink it or to listen to God or some other – whatever other voice that might say, maybe maybe I don't have to do this. Whatever it is, you know, uh, actually um, just that extra day can be crucial, especially because – um, sometimes it is a decision where somebody's just feeling a lot of pressure and spur of the moment or really conflicted about it. I There was a number that used to float around from Planned Parenthood. I, I don't remember and I don't want to misspeak. My, what's in my memory is 20%. I don't remember if that number is the one or if it's higher. But the number was how many percent of women who miss their appointment never reschedule. Hmm. And so the, the the Guttmacher Institute had the data and we knew that there would be a certain number of women who would just never go back. And, you know, some of right. it was the fear of media being there and them being on TV. Some of it was that, hey, we, we gave value to your baby. We gave value to your baby that you didn't have before. We had sidewalk counselors standing there watching for moms right. to come up. We'd say, we'll adopt your child. We will take your child. Please don't kill your baby. And they couldn't get in. So they went home. And you can imagine the voices of these sidewalk counselors just ringing in the hearts and minds of these moms who were right. scheduled to kill their child. Yeah. So we know it worked. Uh, yeah. We, we Do you know, have any kind of numbers on... No. On number of abortions averted? No, nope, no way to know. Um, one fun number. <clears throat> in Wichita, the Summer of Mercy, we had we we were able to close the abortion industry there almost entirely for about five, it was either five or six weeks. And a year later there was a rally 
2,700 people were arrested. There were 2,700 arrests over the Summer of Mercy, if my memory is correct. What year was the Summer of Mercy? 91. Okay. So this is Wichita. It was huge news, massive international news coverage. Because Tiller the Killer, the guy who killed babies in the third trimester, that's whose abortion mill we went to. So he's the one who was killed a few years ago. And he literally would, he, he would dress up babies after they were dead, after they came out of the womb. He would put them in little baptismal garments and take pictures of the babies with the parents, like closure. It was, it was so sinister. It was so demonic. Wow, man. So we were there. And a year later, there was a rally. And they somehow were able to send out a trumpet call. Please, if you were scheduled to have an abortion and you didn't go through with it, we would like you to come to this rally. And again, this is a number that was told to me, but it was over 90 moms came with their babies and went on stage and held their children and showed these babies that were saved because we were there. And, you know, whether that number was 96 or 86, whatever, the point is, these are women who said, yeah, I was going to abort my baby. But now I'm so glad I have my child. And God knows how many didn't come that were invited to come, you know. So we will never know in this life. There's no way to know in this life how many babies were saved. But we know that it would be thousands. And it might have been tens of thousands or more. But the momentum to change the law and the, the different people that went into, you know, parental notification activism and and uh, waiting periods or you've got to show an image a, a, a sonogram of the child there, so many things came out of the rescue movement that also saved lives pregnancy centers that were started i got a call the other day from a man who said if you ever need anyone to testify in your documentary our crisis pregnancy center here in south carolina was started specifically because of Operation Rescue. And the Lord knows how many babies that crisis pregnancy center has been able to save. I like, Randall, that um, you're not contemptuous of the, the less radical aspects of the pro-life movement. If you think back to the civil rights movement, there was often hostility between the less radical and the more radical you know, wings of the civil rights movement. Um, yeah. Now, Malcolm X, for example, displayed some self-awareness uh, when he said, basically, I, they need me to push people towards Mar Martin Luther King because they need to see it's going to be one or the other. And so if they don't want me, then they can go to him and go and, and, and you know, funny. not let it get to the point where it's going to be violence, which I think is kind of cool. But, uh, but, well, let, uh, let me address you know, that. there was, there was a sense of some kind of, what's that? Uh, let me address it because it was, there was a lot of tension sure. in the pro-life movement in those days. National right to life pretended we did not exist. And there was, Oh, really? Real, okay. Oh, there was hostility. They were so upset that we had become the voice of the pro-life movement and they did not have the five rules. So if you don't have radical rhetoric and incendiary images, for example, if you have pictures of the Holocaust, if you're a journalist and you got into Auschwitz or Dachau during the Holocaust and you took pictures of the Jews or you took film footage of the Jews and the torture and the death and you got out and you refused to show it, well, what does that make you? It makes you a collaborator because <laughs> right. they want to hide the truth yeah. and you're helping them hide the truth. So we would say to people, look, you have to show these images. And there were people hmm. in various organizations who refused, who said, no, it's distasteful. It'll hurt the mom's feelings who had an abortion. It's counterproductive. And we would say nonsense, nonsense. There is no social revolution that has survived and existed and prevailed without showing victims. So think of Emmett Till, think of the dogs and the water cannons and the brutality from police in the, in the civil rights movement. Think of South mm. Africa, think of the grimy little boys. I mean, it's, it's a part of our arsenal that we must use is to show the truth. So yeah. The, for me, the issue is this. 
If someone wants to run a crisis pregnancy center, I started one. It's still going to this day. I love crisis pregnancy centers. I love sidewalk counseling. I spent the Lord knows how many days in front of abortion mills in the hot and in the cold begging for babies' lives. I personally saved over 50 children just standing there begging for the baby's life over the course of years. So I love that stuff. The problem is a lot of aspects of the pro-life movement are like a MASH unit. They're a hospital unit. You don't put your MASH unit in charge of the army. That's Mm -hmm. the issue. We have to have shock troops. We have to have the rules of righteous revolution. We must be, Mm. we must respond to abortion in a way that is equal to the crime. So if we believe abortion is murder, we have to act like it's murder. You you know, you you don't have, well, I just want a a place at the table uh, to discuss this with Planned Parenthood and with the (laughs) government. I don't want a place at their table. I want to turn their table into firewood. So part of our <clears throat> mistake in the pro-life movement is that we allowed people who did not have a passion for s- cultural war, because that's what we're in. We're in a culture war. They did not have a passion or, or an understanding of it. We put them in charge of armies. I know of a major pro-life organization today, two of them, I will not name names, both of them with multi-million dollar budgets, One of them, it is their policy to not show any images of aborted babies. Hmm. That's collaboration. Another one, multi-million dollar budget, activists, but they're really nervous about getting sued. So they want to be very careful how they deal with Walgreens, who is now Hmm. going to sell this human murdering drug, RU486. So I would encourage your viewers to keep their ear to the earth because there's some people that are going to start bringing activism, peaceful, but yet confrontational activism, activism to the Walmart chain. I'm sorry, the Walgreen yeah. chain, because we've got to get one of them to crack and not sell this right. drug. And it's not going to happen by sitting at our computer and signing an online petition, those things are just scams to get your email address. That's all they are. I mean, does anyone really believe that if 100,000 signatures come in online, that anyone at Walgreens cares? (laughs) All people have done is build up somebody's email list so that they can rent the email list and send out email. I mean, that's, that's, Mm -hmm. that's an industry. So I'm, you know, our, uh, we have a very small email list. We don't do online petitions because so many of them are, um, they're just they're just dishonest. We've got to have yeah. real, true culture war. The Edmund Pettus yeah. Bridge was a real bridge and the civil rights people had to cross it. So right. that's the, uh, oh, and also if people, I, I know that people might not know this, they can go to randallterry.com. Everything that we, almost everything that we make is free. My books, DVDs, training series, we make this stuff available for free. If somebody wants to make a contribution, they can, we would be thankful. But we're not here to make money. We're here to make war on the baby killing industry. Peaceful, political war. And Now, this is a good way to lead in into the promo because you were saying the response to abortion should be commensurate with the crime. Now you didn't mean violence, but you meant within the moral law, it should be, you know, extreme and, and radical in a way that's proportionate to the crime that's being yes. committed. Yep. Um, so, so uh, as a visual demonstration of that, we can see uh, the, the promo, but let me just to preface that, let me ask you, um, because you were actually trying to block people from entering abortion clinics, and you had to come up with various cle- clever strategies to do that and to keep the police from just being able to drag you away easily. So there's going to be a lot of footage uh, in this promo of police uh, treating people rather roughly. But what were some of the kind of like what was like leading up to that? What 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 were the 
um, the strategies that you used um, to sort of we, create we, a, a, a chain link fence, so to speak. We, we took a lesson from Dr. King and the Civil Rights Movement. They actually had a brochure that people had to sign pledging nonviolence. And I thought, that's a great idea. So we took the theology of civil disobedience that was so articulately um, delineated by C. Everett, I'm sorry, by uh, Dr. Francis Schaeffer. Others uh, talked about it. And then the civil rights tactics were genius as far as I was concerned. So we had a wedding between the two. And we would tell people, no matter what happens, you have to be peaceful. We don't want you screaming at anyone. We want you to be prayerful. And sometimes the police were really rough and brutal. Usually they weren't. We had good police negotiators on the ground for our side that would negotiate with the police. We told them, well, all we want is time. So if you want to get a stretcher, we can negotiate our people taking baby steps to get on the stretcher. And then you can have four people pick the stretcher up and carry people. Uh, if you, you know, some of the footage is almost comical because right. we were just trying to buy time. People would untie their shoelaces and then the police would say, you're under arrest. And he'd say, okay, I have to tie my shoes. And then he would take really a long time to tie his shoes just to buy time for the babies. Mm. And these tactics worked. Los Angeles had a brutal police force. Uh, Hartford, Connecticut, I believe, was really bad. Pittsburgh had some bad incidents. Uh, Atlanta had some bad incidents. For the most part, the police yeah. were professional. But we we did have some serious police brutality that happened to the pro-lifers. And uh, this, yeah, this, and you can see some clips clips of those on YouTube. And this promo also shows some of that. Yep. So this promo that we're about to show, um, you know. If, We've already got a, uh, probably seventeen or eighteen thousand dollars in just the promo, because it is so expensive to make mm. a good film, and we had to digitize all this footage that we own and that right. has been yeah. in storage. Yeah, yeah, I imagine for twenty, thirty something years, high grade professional footage. A lot of it, some of it, you'll see is very grainy, but just the expense of digitizing everything was a small fortune. Then yeah. traveling, um, hiring an editor. There's there is probably well besides all of the digitization, there's probably sixty hours or seventy hours work in this five minute promo that we're about to see. It's just extraordinarily complicated to make a film worthy of a theater or the Discovery Channel or Netflix or History Channel. When we're done, we're going to have a documentary or a serial documentary that is worthy of the history of what happened and that will inspire young people to to maybe not get arrested in front of abortion clinics, but have that same passion, that same fervor. And some of them will, in fact, end up participating in peaceful civil disobedience. If we're, if we're going to yeah. end child killing in America, we've got to employ the tactics of the various civil rights movements that have preceded us, including Operation Rescue. So this promo is to help people understand what we did, but also to help us raise the money so that we can give an accurate historic representation that inspires the actions of the future. Great. Uh, so let's play that now. It's called Operation Rescue, and they say that their mission is to stop what they call the murder of innocent babies, no matter what price they have to pay. Now they're on the way to jail, and if they come back tomorrow, we'll arrest them again tomorrow, and so forth and so on. We're going to maintain law and order. We expected them to be rougher than usual. Understand why you put somebody in jail in America because they don't want to see babies killed. And frankly, I can't understand that either. Can you tell us how many total arrests were there today? 591. They aren't in Kansas anymore. Today, the anti-abortion group Operation Rescue and pro-choice supporters are drawing battle lines in Buffalo.
Nearly 2,000 people have turned out at this church just northeast of Buffalo to pray and to plan, calling on the name of God to bless their efforts to rescue unborn babies. Lord God, tonight as we lift up our hands to you, we as a church and individuals needed to repent of our lack of involvement on trying to stop the killing of innocent children. We are not going down there as the heroes. We are going down there in a spirit of repentance. We are guilty. The blood is on our hands. We're 15 years late. There's no heroes here. We are more guilty than the police when they take us away because the police are not called to be the salt of the earth. We are. Mike, I know that the mayor of Buffalo, as you mentioned last night on Nightly News, practically invited the demonstrators from Operation Rescue. What does it mean to love my neighbor as myself? Well, according to the Good Samaritan, it means that if your neighbor is in danger of death, dying in the ditch, you save him. to a killing center today. Many of you are placing yourself in a vulnerable position. You might be hurt. And this man's severely fractured arm. But if you begin to suffer, you must still do nothing wrong. It's getting arrested too radical. It's obvious it, it can't be too radical in the face of mass murder. You are as safe in jail as you are in the protective hands of God any place else. The mercies of God are everlasting and are new every morning, and you see them in jail in a way that you never do any other place. I was arrested over 50 times, uh, in jail over 50 times. The one thing that it has done is to bring this issue a little bit more clearly before the minds of other people. Media coverage is critical to bringing your message out to the public, to the masses. Finally, there are Christians by the hundreds who are putting their bodies and their freedom on the line to save innocent children and to create the social tension that was so desperately needed. Operation Rescue is a new and a fresh breath of air. Politicians never see the light until they feel the heat. There was a Monday in America where you could own a slave, and then the following Monday, you could not. And I don't think that many hearts were changed between those two Mondays. What was changed was the law. We're saving children and mothers today. We're doing it in such a way that will provide the political clout to change the laws tomorrow. And we will launch an equal force against state legislatures to chip away at Roe and to ultimately make child killing illegal again. I am convinced Roe will fall and child killing will be driven back to hell where it came from. Friend, as you can see, this is a huge undertaking. We are asking for your financial help. Our goal with this documentary is to capture the history of what happened and to show how the rescue movement went to seed and was a key part of bringing down Roe versus Wade. And we also want to inspire the next generation to take this battle to completion and to make it a crime in all 50 states to kill a baby from conception until birth. Please be as generous as you can and invite your friends to do the same. God bless you. So Randall, I have a, a few, uh, we have to go in a minute, but I, I have a, a two or three quick questions. Uh, one of them is how much money do you need to make this documentary? Well, I know that this is going to sound shocking to people, but I've talked to four different filmmakers and all of them 
I, and the first one that I talked to, I was dumbfounded. I thought, you got to be out of your mind. And then they all came in with the same number. Every single one of them said to do this properly is going to be somewhere between one half of a million dollars and a million dollars, period. There's no way you're going to get this shot, edited, uh, colored, music bed, all of the things that you're going to need. There's no way it's going to happen for under a half a million and it could easily run up to a million dollars. So that was jarring to me. And we can't, you know, I, I raise money to run our ministry, but I, I don't have the ability with our, with our small support base to get another half a million dollars from them. So we're, we made the promo, we're doing the crowdfunding, and I'm hoping that there are people there who would like to give 50 or 100 or $1,000 and we will send people an autographed copy of my book that's coming out very shortly called Divine Correction, How God Gets a Nation's Attention. So that book has been in the works for some time and, and it's it's done and it's on its way to the publisher, or to the printer right now, we have a publisher. So if people wanna see this movie made, we would really be thankful for their support. They can go to randallterry.com. You'll see the video and you click on it and it'll take you to a crowdfunding site. Great. Okay. Second question. How important do you think that the, the kind of direct action uh, Operation Rescue did will be in making abortion illegal in the 50 states? If without it, it won't happen. Without it, there will no chance that abortion will be made illegal. Zero. What proportion, what proportion of the activity should be that sort of thing, do you think? It's, it depends on the state, because some states are going to go to the pro-life position easier than others. Right. We, ultimately, we need a, either a constitutional amendment or a federal law. California and Illinois and New York are bastions of demonic activity. Right. Yeah, and there, yeah, yeah. We're, there's not going to be a state law that outlaws it there. There's going to be a federal law that outlaws it in all 50 states. So uh -huh. okay, that's the mission, a federal law. Like there was a federal yeah. law to outlaw partial birth abortion. There's federal crimes against yeah. kidnapping and all, all kinds of stuff. So <clears throat> we're going to end up having a federal law. And to get there, there's got to be activism. There's going to have to be civil disobedience. And the sky's the limit. We don't even have time right now to talk about the ways peacefully and with peaceful civil disobedience and without it. You know, a few weeks ago, you saw people in the Walgreens uh, stockholders meeting disrupting the meeting. Bullhorns and don't oh, kill really? babies. Wow. And they shut down the stockholders meeting. No one was arrested but it jarred the stockholders. And I guarantee you right now, they're saying, you know, maybe we don't need to do this. Maybe we don't want to do this. So hmm. you're gonna- I didn't have... actually hear about that. That's awesome. Yeah, well, yeah. one of the guys, two of them, a pro-life Spider-Man, I don't know if you've ever seen him, the guy that climbs buildings. Um, I'll get you an interview <laughs> no, with him. if you haven't heard of him. Oh, it's, it's scary. I mean, this guy climbs skyscrapers wow. to be a voice for unborn babies. So- um, That's awesome. It's pretty crazy. He was arrested on Tuesday in Phoenix. I think he climbed up a, the outside of a 30-story building. It's scary. It's really, it's terrifying. But he's yeah. trained. He's a stunt man. He's young. But he's doing it to bring attention to the pro-life cause. Anyway, the things are going to have to, him and a friend slept in a closet in the room where the st stockholders had their meeting, meeting, and when the meeting began, they came out of the closet because there was security <laughs> keeping everyone up, and they started shouting, saying, "Don't kill babies!" That's amazing. <laughs> so, you, people can be creative. It's going to yeah, have to great. be a part of what we do. There's no way around it, and I just hope that everyone will count the cost and do what they can do. Everyone can do something. You know, you don't have to have a special call from God to love your neighbor as yourself. Right. You, that's that's like a blanket command. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. If your neighbor's going to die in the ditch, save your neighbor. The ditch today is the abortion mill, the abortion industry. 
All of us are called to do something because all of us are called to love our neighbor as ourselves. All right. If I may, just one more question. Um, now, of course, what God ultimately wants, the most important thing is saving souls. But I really liked a line that you said in this promo, which is that, you know, there was one day slavery was legal and another day it was illegal and probably not many hearts were changed between those moments. And what changed was the law. Can you just expand on that a little bit? Yes. Um, there's a, there's a, a number of people who kind of adopted this. I, I, it was like, it was really more like a slogan that, you know, we've got to love them both. And the pro-life movement is here to instruct people and to teach people. Well, you know, those things are important, but the pro-life movement exists to make abortion a crime. That's, that's the goal. If, if it was a catechism question, it would be, what is the chief end of the pro-life movement? Answer, the chief end of the pro-life movement is to make it a crime to kill a human being from conception until birth. That's it. Mm -hmm. So do I want to change hearts? Sure. But if I'm a slave and I'm in bondage, what do I want? Freedom. I want my slave owner to let me go. And, and frankly, I don't care if his heart has changed. I want to right. be free. <laughs> Nor do you want your freedom to depend on the goodwill of yes. any particular individual. Exactly. Oh, you hit the nail on the head. Yeah. I'm going to use that line. Thank you. Uh, so we, we have to hone in on the mission. The mission is to make it a crime. And part of that mission, I know we got to go, but part of that mission is going to be that we tell our fellow Christians, stop sinning with your vote. Stop sinning yeah. with your vote. Over half of the Catholic community and about one third of the evangelical community have voted for Hillary Clinton, Barack Obama, Joe Biden, who all said, we're going to kill babies. We're going to try and take your money to pay for other people to kill their babies. And those Catholics and those evangelicals who claim to be followers of Christ, who voted for these baby killers, they sinned with their vote, period. Mm -hmm. So we have to start telling people in our parishes, in our churches, stop sinning with your vote. If you vote for someone who told you right. they're going to kill babies, you're an accessory to their crimes. Well, Randall, uh, I wish we could have gotten to some of your more of your personal stories. Uh, maybe, God willing, when this documentary comes out, we can come back and and, I'd be and happy tell to. some stories. Uh, but uh, thank you so much for coming on. This was really fun. I appreciate you having me. You're a great host, and I wish you the best. May God bless you. Thank you. God bless you, everybody. Thank you for listening. If you're watching on YouTube, please subscribe. If you'd like to help uh, CatholicCulture.org out in all of our podcasts, you can go to CatholicCulture.org slash donate slash audio. But also please do go to RandallTerry.com and uh, make a contribution so that this documentary can be made because I really want to see it.